I'm so excited to introduce Hannah Young, who will highlight her work with the British Consulate and introduce our keynote speaker, Amali Tower of Climate Refugees. Amali's talk will be followed by a moderated Q&A with the audience, so get your questions ready. Use the Q&A feature at any time to submit those. And if you're more comfortable using the chat feature, we'll be watching that as well. Now well, let's get started. We are honored to welcome Hannah Young, the Acting Consul General at the British Consulate in New York to our program today. With a background on both international and domestic policy, Hannah's career has spanned many areas of the UK government. Prior to her current role, she served as the Prime Minister's lead official on home affairs policy, a brief that covered policing and criminal justice to counter terrorism and immigration. It was during this time that Hannah led the UK's response to the external migration crisis in 2015. Throughout her time in government, she has also worked on establishing and leading the International Agreements Unit within the UK's Department for Exiting the EU, the EU excuse me, and served as a senior advisor in the Prime Minister's Delivery Unit. Her cabinet office roles on migration and intelligence policy and her three years as a UK diplomat in Afghanistan at the height of the conflict further demonstrate Hannah's dedication to public service. Thank you, Hannah, for joining us today and welcome. Please take it away. Well, thank you, Betty, for the introduction. Um, I'm delighted to be part of your second annual summit and congratulations to you and the team for the exciting rebranding uh, it's a great program that you've got over the next four days and you mentioned briefly my role uh, working for the Prime Minister. I was also responsible for online harms and disinformation, so I'm particularly interested in uh, that element of your uh, upcoming summit program. Um, and I also just want to acknowledge the importance of World Affairs Councils uh, like yours and fantastic events like this that, that engage a wider community in these important global issues and, and doing that in an inclusive and equitable way, um, which is very much at the heart of your new mission statement uh, and your vision. Um, none of these issues are more existential to us than climate change. Uh, and we're approaching a really critical moment. In fact, in 33 days and counting, the UK is going to be hosting COP26 in Glasgow, which as John Kerry put it, is the last best chance for us to join together in taking responsibility for the impact of generational decisions on our planet uh, and on ourselves. Uh, we see on a daily basis, the damage that our actions are having on our people and our habitats, hurricanes, uh, flooding, including here in uh, my home city now, New York, fires, uh, drought, crop failure, uh, and of course, mass movements of people on a scale not seen before. And if we keep on the current track, then the temperature will go up by 2.7 degrees or more by the end of the century. And we know that will have uh, catastrophic implications for our societies. So we need to limit the rise in temperature to 1.5 degrees and we need to collectively pledge to achieve net zero by the middle of the century at the latest. And in the run up to COP26, my government is working at all levels with uh, national governments, with sub-national actors and wider civil society to try and raise ambition across the board. Uh, we need more stretching commitments to reach net zero, uh, as I mentioned, including through uh, near term 2030 targets. We need faster action to protect people and nature from the impact of climate happening now. Uh, we need greater focus on uh, adaptation and resilience for those communities who are affected now. And we also need more funding for climate solutions, including developed countries making good on the Copenhagen commitment of $100 billion to support the developing world. And I want to thank the US president for his commitment last week uh, to $11.4 billion of climate finance, which was a hugely important moment um, for uh, us uh, trying to achieve that 100 billion target. And we need to do all this in a way that puts communities and their needs at the heart of the transition. It needs to be a just transition 
and we need communities to uh, play an active part in how they are going to make that transition. It can't just be something that governments impose on communities. It needs to be a bottom-up approach. Uh, and we will only succeed if everybody takes action. And that includes at a sub-national level where uh, the greatest impact on emissions reductions can be found. And I wanted to briefly mention the Race to Zero campaign, which has been established by the UN, but with uh, UK government backing to support efforts at the sub-national level in support of these goals. And I would really encourage you to, uh, uh, to those of you um, listening in to, um, uh, to look up the Race to Zero and, and, and challenge yourself and your organisation as to whether you can sign up to it. Um, it's all about committing to reducing emissions to net zero by 2050, um, but also making short term targets based on science to take uh, action and steps to get there. Um, thousands of businesses have already joined, um, including some major US firms like uh, Johnson & Johnson and uh, Walmart. And actually, even in the midst of the global pandemic, we've seen net zero commitments double um, last year. And I think companies aiming for net zero now represent a combined revenue of over uh, $11.4 trillion, uh, which is equivalent to more than half of US GDP. So it is really huge and it's a really positive step in the right direction. But we know that uh, businesses and civil society can't do uh, this on, on its own. Um, the role of national governments like mine are really critical. The UK has got a really proud history of taking action to reduce, reduce emissions. Um, we were the first country, I think, to set legally binding emission reduction targets through the Climate Change Act uh, in 2008. And we were also the first major economy to legislate for net zero uh, by 2050. Uh, and as the incoming COP26 presidency, we continue to take our responsibilities seriously we have a new nationally determined contribution to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by at least 68 percent uh, by 2030 compared to 1990 levels, uh, which effectively commits the UK to the fastest rate of emissions reductions of any major economy. Uh, we've also committed to ending financing of coal production. Uh, and as my Prime Minister said last week, we are unapologetic in asking the developing world to end the use of coal by 2040 and the developed world by 2030. Uh, and it was great to see China's commitment last week at UNGA uh, to ending international financing of coal, but they now need to go further in phasing out the domestic use of coal as well. Uh, the UK has shown that it can be done. Uh, and so we are encouraging other countries to do the same. And our prime minister last year published uh, the 10 point plan for a green industrial revolution which is a uh, series of very tangible commitments across uh, the climate spectrum uh, that we believe strengthen our ability to deliver on our overarching pledges um, and also uh, position the UK as a leader in some of the cutting edge technology required to, um, to invest in green solutions such as uh, offshore wind and zero emission vehicles. And we see this effort as central to our economic recovery from COVID um, as much as uh, for uh, environmental gain. Uh, we want to build back better, but we also want to do it in a more sustainable way. Um, and I would really commend the um, 10 point plan to you if you um, haven't uh, had sight of it before. Please do get in touch with the consulate if you want to talk more about our efforts or if you'd like to know more about COP. Uh, and please do sign up to Race to Zero if you haven't already done so. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Amali Tower, the founder and executive director for Climate Refugees, uh, a human rights organisation that calls for the protection and rights of those displaced by climate change. Amali has extensive experience in promoting the rights and protections of refugees and forcibly displaced persons in a variety of contexts including in refugee resettlement protection, evaluation and research uh, with the UN Refugee Agency in Kenya and Jordan on the Syria response, uh, through various NGOs throughout Africa, Asia, the Middle East and the US, and also with the US Department of State overseas uh, US refugee admissions programme. 
Amali is frequently consulted for her expertise in the human rights and humanitarian fields. And most recently, this has included the Afghanistan evacuation response and the human rights campaign work in immigration detention policy, where she's written successful legislation to prevent detention expansion. In addition to her years of experience, Amali holds a master's of international affairs focused uh, on human rights from Columbia's School of International and Public Affairs. She also has a Bachelor of Arts in International Development Studies from the University of California and an International Diploma in Humanitarian Assistance from Fordham University. I'm honoured to be introducing Amali as today's keynote speaker. Uh, welcome to you and let me hand over now. Um, hello, hello. It's uh, wonderful to, to be with you all. Thank you, Hannah, for that lovely introduction. Um, it's very kind. Um, my heartfelt thanks to the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh, um, to, to Betty Cruz, um, Olivia, Kara, and the whole team. Um, this is really a very kind and generous invitation to be with you all here today. Um, I want to especially also um, thank Miguel for grounding us all in the important things. Um, that we've maybe all long forgotten, but hopefully not lost. Um, thank you to all of you for being here today uh, on this afternoon and taking an interest in this very important topic of uh, climate displacement and migration. So let me begin by saying, um, what can I say about climate, climate change and migration? Let me, let me say at the, um, right at the start that it is undeniable that climate change is driving displacement. There are now 82.4 million forcibly displaced people around the world. Around 40.5 million um, new internal displacements were recorded at the end of last year. And that's the highest figure in 10 years. Disasters triggered over three times more displacements than conflict and violence did. Now this, despite the COVID-19 pandemic when movements were, were restricted, you know, that would mean the movement restrictions on people, but also the restrictions imagined to collect that data. So we're probably underreporting. 90% um, of today's refugees come from countries that are most vulnerable and least ready to adapt to climate change. Many of the countries most vulnerable to climate change also host refugees and internally displaced persons. This week, the UN Refugee Agency said it is preparing for worst case scenarios, given the unlikelihood of countries meeting their global climate targets. So take Afghanistan, for example, a country very much in the news, a country at high risk to, dis to disasters, always has been, where almost all of its 34 provinces have been struck by a disaster in the past 30 years. Nearly half of Afghanistan is food insecure today. Four provinces facing emergency levels of food insecurity. Afghanistan has been food insecure even before the Taliban takeover with 40% of crops and livestock devastated by years of drought driven by climate change. Madagascar, this is a country that's never been in conflict, is facing unprecedented levels of food insecurity some of which are at category five, classified as catastrophic by the WFP, that's the um, World Food Program, which the WFP says is only due to climate change. Now, Madagascar's global share of um, CO2, greenhouse gas emissions, is 0.01%, global share in its entirety. It's important that I set the stage for our conversation with, with that picture, with just, just a small little glimpse, but also to reframe a few narratives. Climate migrants are not protected under international refugee law. Climate migrants are those who are forced to leave their home due to climate stressors, and these may be disasters or slow onset climate changes like drought, environmental degradation, rainfall variability. Climate displacement is another term you've probably heard quite a bit of, and this refers to those displaced in the context of disasters or sudden weather-related events. 
Now, um, <clears throat> I want to say, though, make no mistake that both migration and displacement uh, in this context are examples of forced movements. Climate change disproportionately impacts the world's most vulnerable, marginalized, and impoverished communities. It's Africa Climate Week, which kicked off yesterday, Monday, right? And it bears noting that Africa will be hit the hardest by climate change. I mean, in fact, it already is. Now, this is even though the whole continent of 54 countries have a combined greenhouse and CO2 emissions of less than 4%. Imagine that, 54 countries, okay? And they are going to be ravaged the worst, and in fact, already are. Climate change was never only an environmental issue for much of the world, even though it was approached that way for much of the time that we've been dealing with this. For those dependent on the land and its natural resources for livelihood and survival, climate change is an environmental, socioeconomic, and political issue. For the majority of the world, climate change runs the risk of social disruptions, disturbing entire systems, political systems, economic systems, cultural traditions. It violates human rights, indigenous rights, and so much more. 70% of the countries most vulnerable to climate change are also fragile countries. So the risk of fragile countries turning into failed states is actually quite real. Given the right set of circumstances, where institutions are weak, where countries are probably post-conflict, where there's poor leadership, where there's a dim human rights record, where there are oppressed people, the threat of conflict then runs quite high in climate vulnerable contexts. That's why of the 15 countries most vulnerable to climate change, eight already host UN peacekeeping or UN political missions. Climate change heightens and exacerbates underlying vulnerabilities, tensions, and runs the risk of threatening human rights as well, as I've already said. For many of these populations then, climate change can be akin to persecution. So we really need to reframe our global North narratives on migration then, because this is migration as a result of push factors rather than pull factors. The vulnerable are likely to be forced to migrate in order to survive. Contrary to Western nations long held beliefs that these are quote, economic migrants, a term by the way, that does not exist in international law. Ec you know, economic migrants are usually classified as people who are in search of better opportunities. I would challenge you to think about what I've just already presented as, as anything falling within the confines of better opportunities. The most vulnerable of the vulnerable are likely to be trapped for it costs quite a bit of money to migrate. Most migration and displacement will be largely internal. That is within the confines of one's own country. But make no mistake, this by no means minimizes these forcibly displaced populations needs for international protection. Some small numbers may move across borders but it will follow the same patterns as now, which is movement to bordering countries. So con contrary to Global North notions of quote, mass migration, this is really not a threat to Western borders. On the contrary, it's the inaction of Global North nations that are further straining already developing countries, pushing them back even further into poverty and worse. Realize that development gains and are now being pushed back due to climate change driven losses. No one knows how many climate migrants there will be. There are projections, but even the recent World Bank report was based on internal climate migration, based on three scenarios showcasing what can happen with international action at various levels. It is less about projections and more about protections. And by that, I mean, we must concern ourselves with the lack of protections that underpin human security. We can't see people moving as a security threat. To understand the impacts of climate change on forced migration is to act on the basis of protection principles and humanitarian response. Instead of the current security response, you're seeing the world over. And you saw the US southern border just last week. 
While the global south is disproportionately impacted, climate migration is a reality faced by people everywhere and even right here at home and in global north countries. It is important we realize that it is marginalized, oppressed, forgotten, immigrant, indigenous, black, people of color in neighborhoods long neglected or forgotten that are most at risk. So what I then say is this is fundamentally an issue of justice. We need legal protections and there are some small gains in legal guidance provided last year by the UN Refugee Agency where the 1951 Refugee Convention can apply in some contexts. However, enforcement where it comes to international law has always been an obstacle in the international arena. The UN Human Rights Council and other legal gains in human rights law are helpful in securing climate migrant rights in this regard. But again, it remains to be seen how enforceable these, these uh, gains may be. Global South countries are leading the way in terms of adaptation and calling on Global North countries for accountability, compensation, and loss and damage under the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities. We need these high polluting rich countries to uphold their climate finance pledges that Hannah was speaking about of $100 billion a year, which even that we now know won't be sufficient for the climate adaptation that is really the biggest need for developing countries but it is a start, given that we haven't even met those pledges. These countries also need to lower their emissions drastically now. And honestly, they needed to lower their emissions yesterday. So to talk about climate, climate migration is to talk about climate justice. The global warming projections are not good and some impacts are here to stay. But we can reverse and change the course on actions if we demand it. So I like to say that we need everyone to become an activist, not just a climate activist, but an activist, a human rights activist, a people's activist, because this will take a concerted movement that demands action of our leaders to save the planet and its people. I thank you for your time and I really look forward to a robust conversation. Thank you, Amali. Terrific. That was incredibly moving and so informative. Um, before we get into our conversation, I want to remind everyone in the audience to please submit your questions for Amali in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen or use the chat if you're more comfortable with that. But I'll go ahead and get us started. Um, in a recent op-ed, you claimed, um, you mentioned that Vice President Kamala Harris, uh, her root causes strategy for addressing migration stemming from Central America lack specificity and climate responsibility. Can you share more on what are some of the core pieces missing from this strategy that you believe are, are integral to addressing the, the issue of climate migration? Yes, sure, be happy to. Um, Vice President Kamala Harris, as, as, as did the Biden administration, um, we all had a lot of high hopes for, um, for addressing uh, climate change as a driver. Um, that's, that's forcing populations across borders. Um, and with respect to Central America, in fact, um, Vice President Harris did actually say that climate change was, was certainly one of the drivers. Um, however, when the root causes came out, um, you saw a, quite frankly, more of the same, uh, more of what we've already seen in terms of development strategies um, that have already been tried in, um, in Central America. So I'll put it to you this way, the, Primary uh, people that are coming to the U.S. southern border are indigenous subsistence farmers from the Central America Dry Corridor. This is a region from Chiapas, Mexico, all the way to, is it, is it parts of Panama? I'm forgetting now. Um, there are many articles and podcasts. You can hear me talk about this. Um, but is it is a vast region and, in fact, is the expanse and the economic backbone of Central America. Um, there has been several uh, droughts and several consecutive years of drought, and the latest one has been six plus years. Um, there's climate change and there's climate variability happening here. Um, this is also a region where there has been historic oppression of indigenous populations. Um, there is concurrently um, a, a lot of um, national, uh, nationally supported development projects ongoing that requires um, 
really, frankly, exploitation of the land, land grab from subsistence farmers, from indigenous communities who are a human uh, rights oppressed community. This is, you know, going back now several decades, if not hundreds of years. So there is an underlying human rights condition as well that needs to be part of those root causes. Um, the root causes strategy that Vice President Harris put out does not even have the word dry corridor in it. Um, there is no mention in, in terms of solutions and response to talking to indigenous uh, communities, to talking to women. Women are always and often the, um, the, the real sort of heroes who find the resilient solutions um, to help their families survive. Women are who find innovative ways to deal with situations like livelihood loss and crop loss. There are, there's just a host of things that are practical solutions that, you know, we've, we've offered in consultations, um, the humanitarian development community, anybody uh, has written about extensively, uh, none of which was there. A lot of it was tried and true um, policies we've seen before that quite frankly, never trickled down to the people most in need. Most in need. And I'll say one more thing. Um, we have to think about what is our goal and aim. If the goal and aim of a root cause strategy is to stop migration from coming to the United States, then you have to wonder root causes, addressing whose root causes and for whom. You know, So I'm always a little bit um, skeptical anyway of root cause strategies because if they're, if they're based on principles that say we only want to stop migration, then you're really not addressing any root causes at all. Great. One of the comments that we have in the chat is uh, pulls into question how partisan this topic can be, uh, risking even the, the political future for certain candidates, depending on their position. Um, you talk about being, being an activist, right? Ra raising awareness around the, the imperative here and the, the, the timeliness, the urgency around it. What are your, your reactions on how to, to rally um, support um, informed decision-making that isn't partisan? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um, to be frank, if, if the partisanship comes down to um, disputes over science um, as to whether climate change is happening, that's a difficult one for me to even really want to even talk about anymore because um, there, there's just such a need in the world that um, we're all stretched incredibly thin. So you, you have to pick your battles. That's a reality. I can give you a very political response here, Betty, but I am, I have, I, I work about a hundred hours a week and I just have to decide what are the things I can spend my time on. And if, if you can't convince someone to care about something that, because they just don't believe in the data or the science, then, you know, what I find often happens is people are moved when it strikes them, when it hits close to them. And, and that's perfectly fine. You know, um, that's disappointing, but they will eventually come around to um, having a similar need because this is, this is a, what I like to say is climate change affects us all, but it does not affect us all equally because we did not all begin at the same starting point. And people who are, see this as a partisan issue, I think, fail to recognize that the world was never equal to begin with. Yeah, um, that's a really important point also on the power of, right, how do we humanize? Mm -hmm. You have to tell stories. That's really what I'm trying to do here is, you know, people say to me, oh, it's really kind of surprising to hear you be so frank or be an activist because they read my resume and then they're sort of surprised to hear someone who, has done the work that I've done be so be so real maybe um, but I think but these are real situations going on in the world and we have to represent what's happening to people and we have to tell those stories because by informing we become empowered and that's how you build a movement and more importantly sustain one. Excellent. Uh, uh, Sally Mohawk, uh, the director of the International Center for Climate Change and Development in Bangladesh, 
has been critical of the clear difference in news coverage, uh, speaking of, of storytelling and what gets amplified, um, has, he's been critical of the difference in news coverage between the global south and the global north on climate migration. Do you see this disparity in coverage changing anytime soon? Um, and why do you believe the disparity exists in the first place? You've already spoken a bit to this, but if you would like to elaborate. Yes, um, Salimul is, um, I think, very right. Um, in fact, he'll be speaking on a panel I'm hosting on October 7th. Um, he is an incredible um, leader and activist himself and a scientist and a professor. Um, I think the disparity is, is evident in the fact that we care about things. Um, well, I mean, l l we have to be honest. We have to be honest about the fact that um, those who control the strings tell the stories. Um, and that, that is the way the world has always worked. Um, luckily for us, there are, there's a population of young people who are saying, I don't, I don't accept that. Um, I, and, and, I, and I welcome that so fully. My concern is that, will it be sustained? And that's why I speak about movements and, and the need to continue to tell stories and build empowerment which informs actions because that's how you sustain that. Um, how do we build stories from and, and tell and change things? It's by bringing stories that we haven't heard, you know. And by the way, they're not. It's not because they're down here. It's because they've been oppressed to be down here, right? It's it's not a polarity of like it's less important. Someone determined that it was less important. Um, so you know, it it goes back to why I said. Climate change is never an environmental issue. It's the people in power who deemed it such. Um, and and to, to our detriment, to all of our collective human detriment, because you know, a long, long time ago, um, civil rights era, era leaders um, fought for envir environmental racism and environmental justice to be part of the climate change movement, actually global warming back then. And a decision was made by Big Greens um, to that maybe the political capital um, to focus on racism and, and, and more of the social justice issues was not capital they could use while trying to actually ask for lower emissions. Um, here we are, we're finally talking about environmental justice and yet we know that we never actually succeeded lowering emissions anyway. So, you know, it, it, it's a very good example of by suppressing one narrative to try and you know, um, elevate another, um, everybody lost. Right, we have to see the, also the intersection between so many of these topics. They're, they're not to be treated in isolation. So thanks for, for showing that thread there. Uh, we have a question from the audience on what can we do as individuals to make more people aware of climate change so that we can take action? What can we do as individuals? Um, well, I think everybody can, by, but what I mean by everybody can be an activist is, you know, make this a part of your, your daily communication. Um, make, you know, it's not just you're going to recycle or you're going to be a, a, a more um, reflective consumer. You, you need to do that as well. And by that, I, I do mean um, being very reflective of the corporations that you support, the banks you support, um, you know, the role of capitalism in all this. Um, there, there's a lot of research and study one needs to take up. This isn't easy. The information won't just come right at you, but it's out there. Uh, and for anybody who says, um, you know, that information isn't readily available, um, I, I often say, yes, our, our media is quite controlled by a few corporations. This is true. And so therefore we don't necessarily see a lot of these stories. But I often say, this is a computer you're walking around with change the algorithm. Just Google something and you'll change that algorithm. So you do control what you might actually start seeing more of. Um, so there, there, there is a lot of like individual control. And then speak about it, share about it, tell your neighbor, tell your friend, tell your colleagues at school, um, tweet it, you know, it begins as simply as that. And then you'll be amazed at how you will find a bridge to a community that you can actually be a part of and take actions with go and learn from, actually maybe be someone who can be vocal about things, be supportive, take up a cause, take up an action, um, and, and help civil society, community-run organizations. You'd be shocked to learn that 
I founded this work now almost seven years ago, um, and there is no global governance framework that supports this, which means that philanthropy takes its cues from global governance frameworks, which means this work is completely unfunded. And yet here we are, you know? And so it, there's, there's a lot of people like me. I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a rarity. Um, so there, the need is great. Um, and there are so many ways that you can get involved. So just being here today is, is a good first step. Excellent. Uh, NATO has identified climate change as a destabilizing force for countries, which you have noted is accurate. Uh, and NATO has gone on to characterize migration and displacement as part of that instability, which you've also noted as an issue. Can you tell us why it is important to be specific about what aspect of climate change is actually the destabilizing force? Um, well, what aspect of climate change is, is the ability, like, you know, it's important to realize that climate change doesn't, isn't going to happen in this like sort of Hollywood apocalyptic way of like one massive disaster and the whole world is displaced and, and people move across borders and they're, you know, that's how you destabilize the world. No, what's happening is, is, I mean, I don't know if you've noticed, but 82.4 million people forcibly displaced and that number continues to increase. That is destabilization. Um, the fact that you have more and more closed borders that countries aren't who are um, parties to the 1951 Refugee Convention aren't even abiding by those commitments um, puts us in a very precarious situation, right? Because border security is far more of an interest to countries that are parties to the Refugee Convention um, than, than it is to actually protect migrants. Um, so that, that to me is, is, is the, where the destabilization lies. But interestingly, um, security studies will tend to think about it's the migration that can destabilize a country. And so it's an interesting way of looking at the same issue, right? I'm, I'm not so naive as to, as to say that there, there isn't a point there, but I will push back enough to say, you know, it's, it's a bit of like shift it this way and think about what are your actions at the state level that are contributing to that destabilization? Because by continuing with this policy of fear of migration, fear of people moving, and therefore this hardline security response of closed borders, even though we're fully aware that people are on the move, that we can be predictive and we can plan for safe pathways, um, even though we have all that information as governments and we choose not to act on it in a cooperative fashion, um, that's what's creating the destabilization. So climate change doesn't just happen to where there's one disaster. It's this incremental um, instability that it's creating in countries that where basically the, the fragile context means this, your ability to cope is overwhelmed. And if you're already a country that is on, has some of the lowest development indicators in the world, you're some of the poorest countries in the world, how on earth do you cope with the kinds of levels of food insecurity, um, you know, high rates of uh, poverty, internal migration and displacement, increasing frequency of disasters, drought, rainfall, I mean, it goes on and on and on. And these aren't populations that have insurance and, and ways to protect themselves. So that's how it destabilizes. Thanks for that. Earlier this year, we had a program that included um, Dr. Jeff Sachs, uh, who's the director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University and he's an economist. And um, I was, we, we did an Earth Day program. And as we said earlier, we want to, we want to keep coming back to this topic. It's, it's massive. Um, it's essential. It's urgent. It's now. And we also know that people can feel overwhelmed by it. They don't know where to start. Um, and I appreciate you taking the time to, to dig in. One thing that struck me with that conversation with, with Dr. Sachs and with the work that, that you're doing is this question around hope mm -hmm. with something that is so big, <laughs> so urgent and so hard to understand. And, and you know, is it behavior change? Is it is, you know, all of the things that, that we've touched on. Um, I'd love to hear your reflections on how, how you stay hopeful. Yeah, well, um, 
I think I stay hopeful because I, I truly believe we can do something. You know, um, I, I believe in the collective. Um, I believe in, I believe that people care. Um, and I believe that it's just that they don't know. And it's, it's the fact that you don't know that makes you feel so overwhelmed by the enormity of the problem um, that you then just kind of want to put the, blank, you know, the blanket over your head and just go, oh, the hell with it. Like, I can't even begin to like, put my arms around it. I think then that also brings about this, um, someone else will handle it kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think conversations like this is what is needed so that people can actually feel something very tangible. Um, that the people who are responding to these things and who are working on these things are just as normal and human and, um, as, as, and feel the same amount of like fear and desperation and isolation and loneliness um, as, as you do. You know, all the things you mentioned, Betty, I feel. I feel so weighted, you know, I feel so alone. Um, but what keeps me going is, is uh, sometimes I wonder the same thing. And it just really comes down to, my, my work has always been grounded in, I believe every single one of us has the opportunity to make a contribution to make things better. We don't all have to go around finding solutions. I never ever aimed to find a solution, but I sure thought it is my duty to make a contribution towards a solution. And if, if you just bring it down to that sort of like bite-sized level contribution, and we do that on a massive scale, what isn't possible? Excellent. Uh, we have a question on going back to this uh, topic of the business community and how to engage the business community. You've spoken from an individual perspective, um, but I'm curious around any direct action you've had with um, either political leaders or, or the US business um, institutions as a whole, as they are fundamental to any type of change that's, that's um, uh, large scale that, that we would want to see, particularly around climate action. So the, the question specifically is, since the US business and political leaders blocking climate change aren't the victims, as you noted earlier, it's not close to home, um, aren't the victims you listed of climate change and so won't suffer the near-term consequences of their opposition. What approaches have you found successful to engage globally with similar policy opponents? So we talked already a bit about at that more uh, micro level at the individual consumer. Um, can you say more on any ways of engagement with the institutions directly? Um, with, with, on the government level, that's a, that's a little bit easier to talk about. With businesses, I have to say, um, I don't know. I don't know yet because I can't say that businesses are that involved or even aware of, um, of I mean, we're just getting them to sort of like really come into the fold in terms of climate change. But in terms of its impacts on migration and displacement, um, I can't say there's been a whole lot of movement. Um, Part of the problem um, on this issue is, is how much it's just starting to sort of be understood by both the public at large, but also policymakers. And so I, I really want to make sure that that's clear that anybody listening, you're not, you're not late to the party. Um, policymakers are very late to the party. Uh, the media is. Um, so I would say businesses are probably gonna be the latest. Um, it's incredible how much the conversation is about, you know, having a conversation, about informing, about um, um, reframing narratives, as I said, um, about really just not, it's not about being antagonistic, but it's, it's really about just kind of saying what it is. Um, and, and, and that's happening at the same time, you know, while there's like a bit of a global movement of people, you know, sort of starting to speak about uh, things that have been long neglected. So there's a, there's a nice sort of like nexus happening in terms of how we're addressing things in the world. Um, and, and that's institutionally to our favor. And I think it's, you're, you're seeing the product of that um, at the global level in countries and in countries' institutions. Um, we have a long way to go, but the fact that 
loss and damage, um, which is to say the losses and the damage that climate change has caused, which is part, you know, a conversation that has come out of the UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. This is an arm that's existed since, you know, I mean, 1992, and no one's, it's been brought up forever, and it's always a hot potato that gets dropped. This is the first time, really, that you, you're gaining traction on that, and, and you're, gaining, you're getting countries who have actually gone to the UN Security Council, where the UN Security Council would never, you know, entertain conversations about adaptation, loss and damage, migration and displacement, about climate change. Um, because these are not things that would normally fall under the purview of international peace and security. Um, and, and there's still a lot of pushback about this, but there have been, an, the, just this year alone, two um, high level open debates where loss and damage is being discussed, adaptation. Countries are saying, hey, we want compensation. Um, you know, we, and using the term climate refugee. The gains that are being made and they're being made so quickly is um, in terms of the dialogue is incredibly encouraging um, of, of a shift in, in, in power, maybe soft power, you know, and maybe that's indicative of, um, well, movements in democracy in action, hopefully. Great. Let's uh, close with a question on youth. You spoke to this a bit. You heard from Hannah Shin, uh, one of our youth board members, and the work that we've been doing and how the importance of, of authentic youth voice and youth leadership. They're not just our future of tomorrow. They are leading the way right now. So we've seen a number in a uh, rise in the number of youth um, advocates and activists around climate, around immigration, around refugees. Um, what do you think we're seeing, or why do you think, I should say, you, you think we're seeing youth step up in this way? And what, what lessons do they have for, for the rest of us? Yeah, I think what I'm hearing a lot of youth say, which is incredibly hopeful, is um, there's a dawning that there isn't much of a planet left for them. Um, and, and their descendants and the plans that they may want to make. And you're seeing that manifest in the choices that young people are making, which I think is how you're probably really gonna move the needle um, on uh, business and commerce. You know, you're seeing young people say, oh, I'm buying a house, I, I don't want a car. I, uh, they're questioning the entire system and there's, there's mistrust um, of, of everything that's been told. And, and well, that's fair, isn't it? Because I mean, when you when you come into a system that says, well, hey, we're not so sure we're gonna have a lot of resources left for you, it destabilizes your whole like worldview um, on, on what's true and what's not. And I mean, I, I really think one of the conversations we're not having is with psychologists about, you know, what does it mean to be a young person who wakes up to these realities? Um, what does that do to someone's psyche? Mm -hmm. um, because it's, it's a bit of like, a bait and switch, you know? Um, but what I've seen come out of that is, is this really positive movement of we're not, gonna, we're not gonna stand for it. We're gonna demand action. And so, I mean, kudos, kudos to take something that can be really scary and, and, and run with it to, to actually demand action. Um, and and that's, that is incredibly hopeful um, and really the, the biggest hope that I take from all of this. Here, here. Thank you so much, Amali. Thank you for this insightful conversation. Um, thank you to Hannah Young for her remarks and wonderful introduction of Amali. Um, we thank you to our audience for engaging in this conversation and submitting such thoughtful questions as well. To all of our partners who made this kickoff possible, please stay with us uh, for the rest of the week. We have different programs each day, additional performances. Uh, we'll be hearing from uh, Cuban artist Desemir Bueno tonight at 6 p.m. Eastern. I'll have a quick talk with Desemir before he and his uh, friends who have gathered with him will do a performance tonight. So please uh, join us. And if you enjoyed this program, we again have three more days. So sign up and consider supporting and joining the council's 90 for 90 campaign. You can make a donation at atlasgo.org slash 90 for 90 if you wanna join the campaign. 
And also check out our new website and look and all of the good things that are ahead at worldpittsburgh.org. Today's uh, program was recorded and we will be sure to share that after the week uh, is complete. And please complete the survey if you're able. It tells us what's working and what's not and what you'd like to see in the future. Thank you all so much. Until next time.